All right, as we come to Luke, Christmas time, we hear uh, of the story of Mary and Elizabeth and familiar characters, but we come to remind ourselves of just the wonder of Christmas. And as you probably heard on your way to church or in the last week, maybe even a few weeks, Christmas songs have probably sprung up on your playlist or on the radio reminding us of the season that we're in. But I want to ask us this morning is what makes a song memorable? What makes a song powerful? And there's many songs that are out there, but what makes a song powerful? Is it a song that unites, perhaps? Like as we saw in the World Cup, the people singing all together in anthems uh, throughout the world or throughout the stadium? Is it a song that inspires, inspires um, you to live better, live more powerfully? Or is it a song that transcends, transcends time, transcends generation, transcends language? What makes a song powerful? And if you would measure the power, the power of a song you see by its effect, what if I told you that there was a song that could stop a war? That's pretty powerful. And that song is Silent Night. In 1914, in the middle of World War I, around Christmas, uh, on December 24th, I believe, the, the battle uh, between the British and the Germans in the no man's land area, suddenly there was call for a truce, a Christmas truce. And during the night where all the bombs and gunfire have ceased and the echoes and the dead silence of the night, you could hear the Germans sing Silent Night in their language. And then across no man's land where this is where they call it no man's land because that's where if you go in there, you, you get shot and died. So no one would venture to go there. But across that echoing across that field, the refrain of Silent Night would then be heard by the British soldiers singing back. And they would sing that. And then the next carol, O Come All Ye Faithful, they would sing and it would call for a Christ, what we call a Christmas truce that during that time there would be a ceasefire. And what would happen from that is they would then come up and exchange gifts. And these enemies that were just a few days earlier were shooting at each other, were bombing one another, coming together, sharing, and reminding each other of the real reason for peace. And after that ended, this the shooting continued till millions of lives were taken during World War I. We see the power of a song, a power of a song that could, what we say, stop a war. But that power, although as powerful as it was, was short-lived. It's not one that lasts. It's not one that transcends not just for a moment across languages, across time, but it's, a, it's not a song that lasts for eternity. I would say there's a more powerful song. Powerful not just in its effect, but powerful because of its content. It's a greater song that we will hear today. It's called the Magnificat. And it's the Latin word magnify. And it's a song about the grandeur of God, the grandeur of the power of God, the grandeur of the wonder of of God in this season of Christmas. As we sing various songs, you may have songs in your mind that become like earworms that just continue to, to, to echo, you know, like Last Christmas or, um, you know, different songs of, you know, Feliz Navidad, all these songs that can come and just become uh, songs that are ubiquitous with Christmas. But is it the soundtrack of your Christmas? Is it a soundtrack 
of your season, the soundtrack that shows the power of the Christ. And we want to capture that again and see the power of this song, a song that transcends language, culture, time, that has echoed for, and that will echo into eternity. And perhaps we would even sing it in heaven before the Christ himself. So let's come and just meditate, allow God's word to lead us. Let's pray. God, there are many songs that are sung this Christmas. Many songs that are about you, some that are not. But Lord, we pray that we would come to the most powerful song. And it's a song that, that resonates, that exalts, that magnifies you, Lord. And Lord, we pray that it would not just be a merry song, Lord, that it would be our song. That would be the song that we sing in our hearts, not just with our mouths, but with our lives and with transformed uh, hearts and souls before you. So we need your Holy Spirit to guide us, open our ears to listen, um, allow our hearts to resonate with the melody, with the harmony, with the rhythm of your heartbeat as well. Help us, Lord. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. So as we come before this passage, if you have your outline, we have pretty simple three um, points here about the grandeur of God. There's a grandeur of God in joy, as we'll see when Mary encounters Elizabeth. So you look at 35, uh, 39 through 45. There's a grandeur of God in grace as Mary thinks about herself in the story and sees the touch of God's grace upon her life. She sees the magnificence of that grace upon her from 46 uh, through 50. And then we see the grandeur of God in His reign, His sovereignty. I think in your outline it may say sovereign, but it should be His sovereignty. Um, so it's talking about His reign, the grandeur of God in His reign from 51 through 55, and concluding with the statement, about Mary returning home. So as we think this about the grandeur of God, we start with the grandeur of God in joy. Now look at verse 39. It says, Now at this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah. Now at this time, as we, what happened at this time? Uh, you, we heard, I asked Ehaniel to read a little bit, just... Um, so you can give you some context before verse 39, but there, a lot has happened with, uh, what, what was happening at this time. At this time, Mary, who is 13, 14-year-old Mary here, normal, everyday young lady in her, her, her life, living it out, um, maybe has the uh, bar mitzvah coming of age already happening, and she's probably going through her life, helping her mom in the fields, gathering grain, maybe learning in the synagogue, and suddenly, as we saw, her life interrupted by an angel, Gabriel, sent from God, with, with these earth-shattering news. Just think about a, a 13, 14-year-old girl. I mean, that's mind-boggling to me. But, but earth-shattering news, like, so, like it's kind of one after the other. We don't have time to kind of like go deep with, with it. You've heard it so many times, but just think, I just like, just imagine you hearing this, First, surprise number one is God, there's an angel right before you, and he's telling you uh, God's favor, you know, greetings favor one, the Lord is with you. So you hear God's favor is upon you. God is initiating. This is from God, like an angel before you. That's like crazy. That's amazing. That's, that's life changing, right? Surprise number one, God has favor for you. God has grace in your life. He's initiating with you, and she's like, what's going on? You know, she's very perplexed at the statement. Then, surprise number two, you're pregnant. It's like, whoa, okay, uh, I'm preggers now, like, and it's a boy. It's like, you don't even need to wait for the, you know, the ultrasound. It's, it's a boy, right? Like, 
you do not you you you're, you will conceive in your womb a son and bear a son, and not just that. Like think about if if you're a, a young lady or just any pregnant woman, wh what do you worry about? You worry about it's what's gonna is it gonna come to term? Is it gonna what what kind of boy is it gonna be? Is it gonna be healthy? And he tells you will know his future. He's gonna be great. You will know his nature. He'll be the son of the Most High. You will even know his vocation. He will be a king and a throne in the line of David. He's the promised Messiah. And you will know that his life is blessed by God. His life, the Lord it says, the Lord will give him the throne. You know, this is from the Lord. And when you will know that he will not die, he will reign forever. His kingdom without net. I mean, just think about that. God's favor, your preggers. There's a boy, and that you know his future, his nature, his vocation, his life. And, and, and it's like, how is this going to happen? Surprise number three. It's a supernatural. A supernatural conception. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of God will produce this pregnancy. And not just that, it's the very Son of God. This child is holy. And he will be called the Son of God. I mean, that's four surprises there. You would think her knees would buckle to the floor and fall to the floor. And her mouth just like a, a gape and, and, and maybe just like shock, right? And then he adds on top of that. You know what else? You know your 80-year-old cousin, Elizabeth? She's preggers too. <laughs> it's like, what? What is going on? And he's like... Nothing. It's like, you think the impossible? Look at what's impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. And you, what, what, what is Ma, Mary's reaction? You think, you know, like, you know, just like I said, shock, all of it, just floored, surprise after surprise, uh, ground baking news after one after the other. What's her response? I mean, I don't know how long it took her to say this, but she says, Behold, the bond sleeve of the Lord, in verse 38, may it be done to me according to your will. She says, I trust you, God. I'm your servant. Let it be done whatever you want. I understand your greatness. I understand your plan and your power. I submit to it. And there's a faith that comes with that, a faith and trust in the goodness of God. Did she have all the answers? Did she have all the, all the details worked out? No. And so when it says, now at this time, it's at the time she received all this news. You would think, what would you do if you see all this news? You'd probably run to Joseph. You'd probably like, go to your, your mom and say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't deal with this. What does she do? At this time, she went to Elizabeth. She went to confirm what's going on. She went, it says, she arose and went in a hurry. The word here is hurry is, is not like, uh, you know, like all, all, only with like speed and haste. It's with determination that I'm going and nothing's going to stop me. So she went with determination and you think about how far Nazareth is to Judah. It's a hundred miles. You know, hundred miles by foot. You know, I haven't run the mile in a long time, but uh, walking one mile <laughs> takes a long time. <laughs> you know, but think about if you just run and if you walk twenty miles a day, perhaps it'll take five days. It's a week. But she's going, and she's going as a pregnant single woman. You know, Joseph isn't with her. This is all her. And in, the, in this uh, treacherous journey, a single woman on this where, where robbers and, and thieves and, and attacks can happen in the darkness of night, cold, all of that. But she says, I'm going. I'm going with a hurry. And she went with determination, but she also went with conviction. She came trusting in God's promises to her in faith as we heard let it be done 
And she went for confirmation because the, the angel didn't, angel said this and she said, oh, that's nice. No, she's like, she says, nothing's impossible, God. I want to see what is possible. So she went for confirmation to see this miracle that happened to her cousin, Elizabeth, this son in her, her womb. So she went with conviction, she went with determination and confirmation, and she also likely went for affirmation. Who else could understand her? Who else could relate to this news? You know, could her mom? Probably not. Could Joseph? He's probably like, I'm going to leave her. You know, like, so who else would understand but Elizabeth? Because if she is undergoing something miraculous. Similarly, the only other person that could understand would be her. So this miraculous and momentous event in these two women's lives, that's what brought them together, is the, the grace of God, the touch of God, but to move and say, I, I want to see, I want to trust, I want to know, and I want to have someone that understands what I'm going through. And imagine a week-long journey on this, you know, 100-mile trek. You know, what, what would go through your mind as you go through that? You know, you would think fears, right? Fear that, okay, of my relationship with Joseph. What, how, how's Joseph going to respond to this when I tell him that I'm pregnant and it's not his um, and an angel talked to me? Like, how, how is that going to go? It's, and just think about the implications that if she was pregnant... That means it's out of wedlock, that is adultery, that is immorality, that's sexual immorality. And what that, that means is you would divorce. And, 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 you could, and you would be shunned and shamed for the rest of your life. So she feared for her relationship, but she also may fear for her future. Like, it's not, in that community, it's not just, you know, you're, you're okay, you're just kind of, uh, you know, that's the, the pregnant lady. No, what happens is you're ostracized, you're cast out. Everything's a tight-knit Jewish community. They know where you are. You go to synagogue every week. They know uh, all about your life and, you know, each other's lives. And something like this happens. You're not part of the community anymore. You're an adulterer. You have the scarlet letter, so to speak, upon you. You're cast out. You can't even worship. You can't even be provided for. You are now destitute. And even more than that, she likely feared for her life. Because what this means is that if you are an adulterer, they, they, in, in the Old Testament, it's for you to be cast out and stoned to death at the gate. So this is probably all likely going through her mind as she's walking this week-long journey. But, we don't, but how do we know how she, how she responds? Although with all these fears... With all this uncertainty, with all these possibilities, what does she do? She chooses to trust. She chooses to trust that may it be done to me according to your word. That God is good. That God will take care of me. That God will protect me. God will provide. God will guide. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know what is going to happen. I don't know how everyone's going to respond. All I know that this is God's plan and that he's good, and let it be good, and let it be done according to the way. And as she's going along, she's likely thinking about all the miraculous births in their, in their history. And we see that, how do we know that? Because as you will read in, in, in the song, a lot of what she's saying is from songs and, and prayers of Hannah, which is the, the mother of Samuel, who was barren, and prayed for a son, and prayed that and promised and would, that would become the prophet to, his peop, to God's people. She probably thought of Hannah's song, Hannah's prayer, Hannah's, Hannah's petition to God in, in response to God's miraculous birth to her. She probably thought about Sarah, as you think about the uh, woman in old age, who else had a woman in old age was Sarah, the child of promise who had Isaac. 
Remember, his name means laughter because she laughed. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm old. You know, but in Genesis 18, he probably thought about the miracles, the child of promise, that through Isaac would come the line of the Messiah. She probably thought about Samson, about the wife of Manoah in Judges 13, that he would be the deliverer of the, from the Philistines, the Israels from Philistines. So he thought, thinks, she probably thought about these, these, these miraculous pregnancies she's going on, the child of promise, the child who's going to be deliverer, the child who's going to be the prophet to God's people. But that all culminates in this miraculous, the child who is the Messiah. The king that will reign forever. The deliverer of God's people. So you see, as she came in now, at this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judea and entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So she, she didn't say like, she said, likely said, Shalom. Shalom, which means peace be with you. And, and this is peace indeed. And, and what happened when Mary, uh, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting. The baby leaped in her womb. This baby is, is John. As if you read in, uh, for your homework, read the first part of uh, Luke there. Um, that, that is how John was pronounced. And John is the forerunner to, to, to Jesus, the one that points to him. But it le leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. You hear just, just Mary saying shalom, Mary greeting shalom, just hearing the mo voice. I, I imagine she probably, you know, as he entered the house, there's, a, there's a, like a, a, a courtyard. And Elizabeth didn't, maybe, didn't even see Mary, just heard Mary's voice. That from that, John leaped, baby John, leaping for joy, springing up. And, and this word leaping is, is the word in, 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 that Jesus uses in, in Luke 6.23 about the Beatitudes, that if, when you get a reward, you leap for joy in heaven. Like he's saying, blessed are you who are persecuted, for when you receive the reward, you leap and rejoice, because that's what you're going to receive in heaven. You receive that reward. So imagine, how would you react if you want a reward, that you, you, you received the lottery, for instance? You know, I don't remember what, what the, 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 win, the winnings were. At. You got $60 billion. You're like, how would you jump? You would probably, you know, like, I don't want to jump on stage here, but it was like, it would just like, you would probably jump all over the place. That's, that's the joy that John's showing. John leaping like that, like, like Mario, like, doo doo. You know, like, he just, he's like, yes. It was exuberance, with enthusiasm, with excitement. What it's saying here is that John couldn't contain this joy. And this joy happened because, simply because of Jesus' presence. And, and it was so startling to, 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 to Elizabeth. You think Elizabeth, you know, this is her first baby. She doesn't know how, you know, how it feels. But I'm sure she felt like, you know, kicking and punching. You know, I remember when, when my kids were in, uh, or, or when Melania was praying with my kids, and I could see, like, little arm like pushing out and it's like it's like whoa that's crazy give me a high five you know like it was but this is something different that it just so startling it it, it jolted her body this leaping prophet in this belly that that she cried out she's like oh you know like he cried out with a loud voice and, and it's not just what's interesting is not like like ow you know like <laughs> that that's what she said but it's she cried she shouted and she exclaimed and this word crying out is, is also, what's interesting, it's also the word that describes what John is supposed to do as the herald, that he's a voice crying out in the wilderness. Elizabeth is kind of like the mouthpiece of John, like he's already, he's already crying out, you know, pointing to Jesus here um, in the womb. And 
what it's saying, what she's doing here is she's proclaiming. When it's saying, you know, uh, crying out with a loud voice, that is talking about that it cannot be hidden. That it's not like, oh, Mary, uh, uh, glad you came. You know, you, you want to share the secret? You know, like, no, she's like, I want everyone to know. I'm not going to hide it. I'm going to declare this. I'm going to say this so all that can hear. And, and she's declaring that. So you see, these things cannot be hidden. The joy of John can't be hidden. The proclamation, the declaration can't be hidden. And, and, and this is just like, like mother, like son, just, just showing and pointing to the baby in, 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 Mary's, in Mary's womb. And what does she say? She's saying, bless. Blessed and blessed. He said, blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of the womb. What is he saying? What's blessed means? It means happy. Happy are you. Happy, not just happy in the circumstance, but happy in God. That you have this joy. Happy are you. Not because that you're pregnant, but what is in you? Who is in you? What she's doing, she's praising. She's praising Jesus. She's praising the Son. <coughs> she's praising and saying, Blessed are you among all the women in the world, in history, ever. Why? Because of who is in your womb, the fruit of your womb. Not because you are blessed. No, it's because you're blessed by the blesser who is in you. And we see this, this posture of, of, of Elizabeth here, this posture of you see, of, of humility. And he, she goes, how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? You know, you would think, you know, when you, when you hear that you're, like you're pregnant, you know, you know when, when you hear those news, you're like, guess what? You know, I have good news. I'm pregnant. Like you would share people, you would tweet it, you would, you would text, you would call your mom, you would call whatever your friends and say, I'm pregnant. You, that, that's something that you want to share. And, uh, and obviously Elizabeth, which is, who's 80 years old, would be like, this is crazy news. I, this is incredible that I am, am pregnant. But well, does she say that? Does she say, hey, guess what happened to me? How can this be that I'm 80 and pregnant? Did she say that? Or, or how can this be that you're a virgin and you're pregnant? No, what is the focus of her praise? Is how can this be? That the Lord would come to me. What an honor it is. What an honor it is for my Lord. Already, already in submission. Already in reverence to this Christ child. This posture of worship. That Elizabeth is saying, how, how can this be? That you would come to me, Lord. How, how am I a part of this? How am I even in this story? How am, how am I in the presence of the Lord? You know, she's saying the mother of my Lord, saying that the, the vessel that carries by is, saying, is, is directed at my Lord. That's like, blessed is the fruit. Blessed are you, Lord. So you see this, this worship that cannot be contained, that John shows, that the joy, the exuberance of joy and worship, that say, this is who I'm talking about. This is who I'm pointing to. And, and, and Elizabeth is saying, this is, this is what it's about. This is who it's about. And what did it take? It just took the sound of your greeting, she says. I didn't even need to see you. I didn't even need to know. I didn't even, you, you imagine here that, that it just, the utter shalom from from Mary's mouth, hitting her ears. And baby John le leaped for joy. John, jo what is John doing? John's confirming who it is. John's pointing to the Messiah, that this is the Lord Jesus. And, and both mother and son are just overflowed with joy just at the mere presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's even like baffling is how old how far along is, is Mary? One week. If it takes that, I mean, if she left at that time, and it, she's one week 
No, lo- no larger than a one-week fetus, and yet even the mere presence of the Lord invokes this uncontainable joy. That the presence of God, baby John, just leaps and dances that points to the Savior. That this proclamation that, that Elizabeth can't contain, it says, bless, I must say it, I will say it loudly, I will say it so all can hear. At the proclamation and, and the joy of His presence, the joy in proclamation, the joy of praise. Blessed, happy, how honored I am to be in your presence. And here, then it sees not just the joy in the proclamation and praise, but also the joy in faith. And what does she say? She says, and blessed, verse 45, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Elizabeth, what is Elizabeth saying there? That I know that you believe, Mary. How is that possible? How did Elizabeth know that even Mary had faith? How did Mary, Elizabeth knew of her trust? Now think about it. How did Elizabeth know all this just from a greeting? How did Elizabeth know that Mary was pregnant? How did she know that, that she was pregnant with the Son of God? How did she know that, that, that she should submit to Jesus as Lord? How did she know what Mary was promised? How did she, she know that the Lord spoke to Mary? And how did she know that Mary responded in faith? I mean, she didn't know Mary was coming. Right? There was no heads up. There was no tweet. There was no text and say, hey, get, I'm, I'm heading over. She did not know Mary was coming. The first just inclination was when Mary spoke. And, and she just said, hey. She just said, hi, Elizabeth. I mean, that's all she said. But how did Elizabeth know all these things? We know that in verse 41, that it wasn't... Elizabeth, who was speaking, it was the Holy Spirit. It says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. This was not common knowledge. This was a supernatural revelation. The Holy Spirit is revealed and declared the truth of God out of Elizabeth's mouth the truth of the virgin birth, the truth of the incarnation, the truth of the divinity of Christ, the truth of the humanity of Christ, the truth of the faithfulness of God. The whole grandeur of God's plan expressed with joy and experience because the Holy Spirit was revealing it and declaring it through Elizabeth. That through her he permeated her thoughts and mind to speak His Word. And that's what happens when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You speak the words of God. You speak the truth. And this is not unique to Elizabeth. It's not unique to Mary. This happens to all of us when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. If you turn to, or just listen in Ephesians chapter 5, you remember this. 5 verse 18 to 20. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 and 20 says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when you are unhindered and surrendered to His will and His way, His Word overflows out of you. That you sing, you say and you sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, melodies, thanksgiving, praise, all pouring out of your heart with a heart filled and unfettered by sin, unfettered by by the flesh, all abandonment to Christ in the flow of the Spirit and His movement. And this is true for all believers. Those who put their 
faith and trust in God and those that have received Christ. And just think about that. That is something that we will, can all do. Those that are born again, those that are the new creation that has the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, the inner man now made new, can speak the word of God. Speak His word, the, the words that, not new revelation, but the very revelation that He's already spoken in His Word. You think about all the songs that are sung this Christmas. Unbelievers can sing. They sing Silent Night. They carol Joy to the World. But they can't express the worship and adoration of the Savior. They can't express the thankfulness and the, the honor and the reverence. It's just karaoke to the latest Christmas playlist. But those that worship, they see the grandeur of God in His truth. They see His plan of salvation. They see this, his, his promises, His faithfulness, His love and His grace. They see the grandeur of the Savior, the Christ of, the, of Christmas. That the humiliation of the King here entered into existence as a baby to live a life that we could not, to be our substitute in the death that we deserved, to be our salvation. And they, knowing that, speaking that, bringing to mind those things will be expressed just like Elizabeth, just like John, in those that are filled with the Holy Spirit, those that are of Him. And you see, these, this is the, the, grand, the, the joy that cannot be contained, the joy that could not be held back. Because they were in the presence of Christ. And they spoke the word of Christ. Spoke His truth as it's revealed. And it, we, before we look at others, we've got to look at ourselves. We are in the presence of God. We are present this season. Where is the joy in our celebration? Where is the leaping and dancing? Where is the pointing and crying with a loud voice? Where is the proclamation or declaration? Where is the humility in saying, how can it be? The reverence. Are we saying to ourselves, you know, how can it be that you would come, Jesus? That I am even in this story, that you would even touch my life. How could it be that you came to save me? How can, you, how can it be that I, the worst of sinners, that I am found worthy to become your child. How can it be that I'm invited into this mystery, this relationship with the Creator God? And we, we only can say that. We only can leap like John. We can only declare that Elizabeth, like Elizabeth only if we see the grandeur of God. And we, when we see Him in His grandeur, in His plan, in, uh, in, his, in, in, his, in his, his wonder of it, and it opens our eyes to this, then we can be surrendered to the Holy Spirit and say, I want to be about you. I'm leaping and celebrating. But perhaps we're not. Perhaps we're not declaring. Perhaps we're not leaping and celebrating. Perhaps we're not in humility and reverence because we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Not to say that we don't have the Holy Spirit. We all believers that you know, trust in Christ will have the Holy Spirit, but those that are His will always be His. But the working of the Holy Spirit is hindered by sin. That he's not able to control when we are holding back. You know, you think about the, the picture that Paul said in Ephesians of, 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 of being not being drunk in the spirit, uh, drunk with wine, but drunk in the spirit. He's saying, in comparison, that when you're drunk, you have no, no hindrance. You're completely surrendered to the toxin. And you're moving according to the alcohol in you. Say, no, don't do that. Do, the, do that with the Holy Spirit. But what we do is we stiffen. We resist. And we hold back. We cling on to our sin. 
And that prevents us from moving according to the Holy Spirit. But how do we, how do we get back to that? We must let go. We must let go of what is hindering us. Is there a sin in our life now that we are holding on to? Bitterness, selfishness, idolatry, whatever it is that was holding us that we don't want to give, that's how you can sing again. That's how you will dance again. That's how you will proclaim the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs where thanksgiving will fall out if you just let go and see the grandeur of God. Because those that do can't help but leap for joy, can't help but tell others about Christ. And so this eruption isn't just isolated to John, to Elizabeth, but we see it's in Mary. The grandeur of God is, not, uh, is only not only in joy, but in grace. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. And, mercy, and His mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear Him. Just the mere presence of Christ, John couldn't hold back, Elizabeth couldn't hold back, and, Mi and Mary couldn't hold back either. And you see that she was welling up and erupts in this song. As you, you hear this song, it's full of theology. It's full of the understanding of God. It's, it's full of prophecy, as we'll see, and prove what we call eschatology, even the end times of the reign of Christ. And obviously, of Christology, of, 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 of the center around who Christ is. And, and she's, you see that this is full of the Word of God. The references in this is all throughout God's Word. In 1 Samuel, of Psalms, Isaiah, Habakkuk, Deuteronomy, it's in the law, it's in the prophets, it's in all these different things. And, what, and he's like 13 years old. 13 years old understanding this. Like, how, how can that be possible? And there's a depth of understanding. There's an illumination insight that is way beyond her years. But I think it's not, we should not only commend Mary, but we should see that this is just like Elizabeth. This is divinely inspired. This is the inspiration. This is the breathing of the Holy Spirit out through Elizabeth's, just like through Elizabeth's mouth. This is also through Mary's. That the Holy Spirit took Mary's knowledge of God's Word and brought it together in, to proclaim it in this manner. You know, back in the days, they didn't have you know, the Bible that you hold in your hand or the app, they didn't have that. How did they understand God's Word? They memorized it. You know, you, we had, you know, Bible memorization just a few weeks ago. They did it every week. They did it every day. They memorized passages of the Bible. Remember, just think it, not just remember uh, 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 James or the little passage. They memorized the whole Old Testament. So it was a Bible memorization contest like every day. What, what the Holy Spirit did was He used and brought all those passages and brought to mind so that Mary expressed it up in this song of adoration and praise. And what, what did Mary do? You know, she took different songs and different passages and allusions and direct quotations. I think this is what we call a mashup. This is called a remix. Mary had a remix. Mary had a mashup where you take a chorus from this song and you put a verse to it and you put a bridge. That's what she did. She's taking it from, from Psalms, from 1 Samuel, from Isaiah, from Habakkuk, Habakkuk, Deuteronomy, and she put this song together that she's been thinking about all week, likely humming along the way to, 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 see, to see Elizabeth. And she's like, this is my song. This is, I, I cannot hold back. And what does she start out with the, the first verse? She says, my soul exalts the Lord. And this is the word where we get magnificat. It's a Latin 
translation for that first word. And actually, in the Latin, the first word is exalt. The first word is magnify. And this word magnify means to make great, to, to glorify, to praise greatly. It, it's, not, it's to bring greater light like a, like a magnifying glass, right? You, you make it bigger. You make it to, to be seen in, 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 his, in His greatness. You expand the scope. You know, we, we know that you can't make God greater. That's not what she's saying. She's like, I'm making God greater. But you can expand your view of God. I, want, I, I kind of liken it to if you've ever visited the Grand Canyon. You know, you can look at the Grand Canyon through binoculars. And you're limited to this view. It's like, oh, that's cool. Wow, I see these, these, can I see these, these ridges and that's big. But you only see in that small point of view. It's not until you take off those binoculars and you see the 360 degree view, the splendor, the grandeur of the Grand, the Grand Canyon, that you are in awe of it. And similarly, that's what it, how is it with God? It's like, it's like seeing a picture of the universe in your textbook or being an astronaut looking and being in space Seeing all around you the wonder. The Grand Canyon didn't change. The universe didn't change. Just your view of it changed. And that's what, 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 what Mary's doing here. My, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul expands the scope to see the Lord in His wonder, in His glory here. And my spirit has rejoiced in God. This, this expression of joy and gladness is, is, is exuberance that rejoice. And, and notice that what she's saying, my soul, my spirit, what she's saying here, she's saying my inner self, my essence, which is my soul, or the, my spirit, the immaterial part of me, my life. What she's really saying is all of me, every part of my being magnifies, it rejoices. And not rejoices in myself, not rejoices in my, my blessedness, in my circumstance, but rejoices in in the Lord, in the, in the Master. In, I'm just a humble servant. He's my Lord. He's the Lord. I, I submit to Him, and I rejoice in God, my Creator. Think about the title she's using here. The Lord, God, the supreme source of my life and, and in my being. And not just that, but it's my Savior. That I understand that I need saving. That I can't save anyone like... Um, some of our, our Catholic friends may believe it's not, she's not the one that can save. No, she needs a Savior. She says, I, I have a Savior. I, I, I need Him. I need a Savior. I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. He is my Savior. I need deliverance and rescue from the wages of sin. And this is the, the, this is the phrase of all believers. This is the song that we must sing. This is a song that exalts and rejoices. It says that you are the Lord. You are the master of my life. And you are God. You're the creator of my life. I rejoice in you. And, and you are my Savior. It's not just simply that you believe that there is a God. That you must recognize His Lordship. You re must recognize His and your need for Him as Lord and Savior. This is the song of all believers. This is the song of all Christians. If you are true and, and, and born again, this will come out of your mouth. This is the song of all who are His. Because he says, she says that she gives a reason. She says, you know, for. And, and she, what she says is, this, the reason is grace. The reason is the grandeur of grace. And she says, God's story somehow intersects with my life. She says that in verse 48, For he has, has had regard for the humble servant of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. What she's saying here is that God somehow paid attention to me. Somehow looked at me. He's like, regard is, is it's to actually pay attention. It's like, she's like, who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm a, I'm a, 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 a bond slave. I'm a slave. I'm a servant. I'm a nobody. 
I'm a nobody from nowhere. I'm unimportant. I'm forgotten. I'm inconsequential. I'm lowly. The humble state is saying, I'm so low. I'm the lowest. I, I am nobody. I'm the low of the low. Yet, God saw me. And God chose me and plucked me out of obscurity. That's grace. So I'm not worthy of that. There's nothing in me that merits that. But He did. He initiated and he gave me this gift. He, he somehow looked and had regard and paid attention and paid attention with me. And he said, look, behold, look, from this time all generations will call me blessed. All peoples, all kinds of races, people will understand that this kind of, this grace is, is a life that is, those that are in grace will be blessed because all of his doing. He included me as part of this story because of His grace, because of His plan of salvation. And, and all will see and count me as blessed. I am a part of this story, a nobody, a footnote. But He has made me noteworthy, blessed. And that, that, is, that is every believer. That every Christian that truly understands, like, who am I? that He would choose me to be His child. And then she moves from the personal to the greatness of God to fo focus on Him. It says in, in 49, For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name, and His mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear Him. You see, he's, she's highlighting the aspect, look, look at His might, see His greatness, see His holiness, see His mercy. For the mighty one, the almighty, the most powerful one, that no one can thwart his plans, he did this. And what did he do? He did great things. It's in the plural, not just one thing. He didn't just do one thing. He did great things. He did surprising, significant things. This word great is loud and mega. He made it like ginormous. What, what kind of grace is this? What kind of love is this? What kind of unexpected surprise is this? He said, He did this. It was His power. It was His plans that carried this out in my life. You know, just think about Mary, the, the lineage that she was born as a descendant of, of David in the royal lineage. And, then, and she was also engaged to Joseph, who is also of the royal lineage and born, born in Bethlehem in at a certain age and time in history in the calendar of God, you think about like the prophecy in Daniel saying how things happen. You know, all of this God orchestrated, uh, moved heaven and earth so that, that this can happen. He said, He did this. This is not by accident. This was His greatness, His might that has done great things for me. And I can see that nothing is impossible with God because He has done it. And then he says, holy is his name. Pure is his name. Blameless is his name. What, 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 what Isaiah chapter 6, as we, we hear that, this is his nature. He's unlike us. Holy, holy, holy. He is pure in goodness, pure in righteousness, unlike us. Holy, completely white. Holy is his name. But yet, you would expect, if holy is his name, how can sinful man approach? How can, who can may ascend to the hill of the Lord? How can sinners who are filthy and, and, and rebellious against the infinite God, how can we come? And that's why she says this juxtaposition of holy and mercy. Not judgment, mercy. And His mercy is upon generation and generation towards those who fear Him. Instead of judgment, He extends mercy, compassion, forgiveness. And this is only possible because of the great things He has done. The, the great things of bringing God, the man Himself, Jesus Christ, to dwell among us. To humble Himself, to die on the cross as our substitute on our behalf. To take on the judgment that we deserved upon Himself. That's why He can extend mercy to generation after generation. What she's saying is, to all humanity. Mercy is extended. And it's extended to this generation. To you and I right now. 
Because God is mighty. Because God is great and He is holy and He is merciful. And He says to, towards those who fear Him, this is not a condition, but a characteristic. It's not saying that because those who fear Him, He will send mercy. He's saying those that have received mercy will be in reverence and awe of Him. Those that have received mercy, that have responses to mercy, will have worship and awe and reverence of, of God. And they will come in reverence of the Mighty One. And this is the song of all those that are touched by mercy. These are the song of those that are touched by grace, that magnify the Lord, that say, Rejoice in God my Savior, that I, I, I magnify with all that I am because He chose a nobody like me to be His child. That I am His and He is mine. And all the generations will call me blessed, will call you blessed if you are His because you are with Him. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. I am His and He is mine. Because the Mighty One has done great things for you. He revived your dead, rebellious heart to respond in faith and trust. He put a song in your silent heart that you can even say, Mag I magnify you. He turned you from a self-exalting to sun-exalting to focus on Him and worshiping Him. Although He is holy, I am under His mercy and I come in awe and reverence. I mean, is this your song? I mean, do you have a mashup? Do you have a remix that tells this about, about God? That must be our song that we sing. And she goes on to, to focus not on the grandeur of God in His grace, but look at His reign. And we'll, we'll quickly just go through 51 through 55. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Here, Mary brings back all that God has done and looks at it with the shadow of what is to come. And you see, he, she says, he has seven times. He has the mighty deeds. He has scattered, brought down, exalted, filled, sent away, given help. So what she's doing is she's recalling the things that God has done and fulfilling it in Christ, seeing the final fulfillment in Christ. It's almost like back to the future. I look back in the history to confirm what's in the future. And you notice that she says this all in past tense. And this is something that the prophets have used as a, a form of speech that says it's a guarantee that it's going to be done. And she shows the rule of the king here. The rule in victory, the rule against the proud, and the rule with faithfulness. And she sees the rule in victory, that he has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has, you see, he, she says it in three, three ways. He has done his mighty deeds in his arm. So he's done, he's accomplished it. He did the acts, the mighty deeds. And his arm is talking about his power, his direction, his, his strength in battle. That under his direction, under his power, he has done this. He has, has a victory, a miraculous victory. And this is the, 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 the imagery that that the Old Testament uses when he talks about deliverance from Egypt, from, from the, the Pharaoh, that, that the mighty hand and outstretched arm of God is the one that carried us through. And that's what he's saying here, that, that through, the, through, through his fighting power, that we have victory. That the final fulfillment of victory that we ex have experienced will not just be over Egypt and our enemies, it will be over the very enemies of Satan, his dominion, angels. But for us, it will be over death and over sin at the cross and, and resurrection. And in, this King Jesus will rule in a very, a very obvious and almost like reversing way. 
and it's against the proud. And you'll see it in three aspects. Pride in the heart, pride in position, and pride in possession. So three, he will, he will deal with the pride, rule against the pride, proud. Pride in the heart, pride in position, and possessions. And we see this, we know that pride goes before the fall, as we've heard. The fall beca- calls, comes because of pride. And this is not just pride in like self-importance, but what is this in pride in relation to God? That I am all I need. That I am the center of the universe. I don't need anyone else. That's the, the idea here. That I am self-important in myself. I have the satisfaction in myself. And so when he says, she says, in the, she quotes in this, in verse 51, He has done mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. I mean, he looks into the heart and they, he sees an opinion in the, and says, You know what? I'm okay. And I'll, I'll be okay. I'm all I need. No God, no big deal. I mean, that kind of attitude. And he, what does he do? What does God do? He will scatter them. He will dash them. Like, like a bull in a china shop. Like, a, like, you know, Legos that just like, you just dash and it just goes all over the place. It, the same, the word of scattered here is what he did with the Tower of Babel. Where they got together and said, we can reach the heavens. We don't need God. And God said, guess what? You do. I scatter you. And he deals with it like, like that. He sees and he knows and he will scatter and he will say, I will let you know that you do need me. That you are not the center of the universe. And so he will scatter those that are proud in the heart. And he will scatter those, he will also deal with those that are proud in their position. These rulers and their thrones. And you see the, the reversal of this. He brings down the high and he, the low are brought high. The ru- rulers here is dynasty. That those that feel that they're secure in their position, that, that they're secure in this place, that throne, this, 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 this ruler, this place of rule, a place of authority and admiration, that I am a somebody. What happens? He brings it down. He tears it down. He takes it down. There's a takedown of thrones. There will be no thrones. Those that will be elevated are the humble that says, I am a nobody. I have no place to stand. Those are the ones that are lifted and exalted. And that's the philosophy of Jesus when he was in ministry. In Matthew 23, he says, But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. As we heard in James also, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And if we come to God with pride in our heart and say, look at my reputation, look at what I've accomplished in this life, look at who I'm associated with, I I came to church, I did this, I did that. He says, no, we must come empty hand. I have nothing. I need you. I have nothing. Everything else doesn't matter. That's what he means when he tears down thrones. And those that have pride in their possessions, he has filled the, um, the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. Those that put their trust in what they have. The rich here is not just uh, those that you know, are like dripping uh, you know, with gold and all that. It's talking about those that have, you've gotten, you gotten enough where you don't need anybody else. There's an abundance there that you don't have a dependency on anyone. And that's reversed with hunger. The hungry here is they're starving. They have cravings that they're dependent on others. And that's the attitude here. Those that say, I don't need anything. And those that say, I have needed of everything. What happens? Those that are hungry will be filled with good things. The good and quality that will last, that matter. And those that think they have everything. Or that think that they can figure it out on their own. Find out that it's all in vain. And nothing. If we remember the rich young ruler that thought he had all, he's like, I'm good, you know, just tell me how to get to heaven. I'm almost there anyway. And he says he walked away with nothing. But those that were hungry, the prostitutes, Bartimaeus the beggar, 
a tax collector, a Samaritan woman that says, I don't have, I hunger and thirst. They left eternally full. And this may be, think, you may think this is outside the church. This is the church. As Jesus called out the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3, he says, you think you're okay. You say, you're, you're, you're either hot or cold. Let me know which one you are. But you say in your heart, I am rich. I have become wealthy. I have no need of anything. But you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind. Come and buy gold, refining the fire, so that you may become rich in the white garments so that you may go clothe yourself. These are people like us that we think we're okay. No, we got to come in humility. Say, I am nothing. I have nothing. And sometimes we come with our security in our ministry, security in our church work or church things. We must come and say, I, I am but a servant. We must come hungry and say, I need you. I can't do this day without you. And, and we see this reflected in our prayer life. We, when we say we don't need God, it's not to say that we, we expressly say that. We say that when we don't pray. We say that when we say, I don't really need to ask of you anything because I have all I need. We say that when we don't read His Word because, well, I don't need your guidance today. I can do it on my own. I'm self-sufficient. I don't need your Holy Spirit to guide me and move me. I'm okay. No, you, you got to see. You got to see your reality that you do need. That you can't do this day without Him. That you need His Word and His Spirit to guide. And so this King, Jesus will rule in a way that will dash down all the proud and will rule in faithfulness. And lastly, he, she ends with a covenant that he says, He has given help to Israel, His servant, who remembered His mercy as He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. I mean, there's, there's so much here. We don't have time to go into the covenant, but basically God chose Israel not because Israel was great, because He chose Israel because He chose Israel. It was grace. He says, I loved them because I loved them. Not because of anything they did, but because of what, who I am. He says, He made a covenant with them and said, I will be, you will be my people, and you will break that covenant, but I will be faithful. And I will fulfill the covenant. I will fulfill the terms of this contract uh, of, of you being my people by pouring my own blood, by atoning for your sins, all the sins, and not just Israel, but all of humanity. And so when it says, He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and, and his descendants forever, the descendants include Israel and true Israel, which is the church, which is you and I. He, so she shows the faithfulness of God, that God is faithful. Not in remembrance of His mercy, not that He forgot it, but He's saying, because of it, because I'm merciful, I will help. I will fulfill my promises. And she ends with the faithfulness of God. And this is the glorious song of Mary. But it's not Mary's song, it's the grandeur of God, the God song about God. His beauty, His majesty, exalting God. But what's interesting here, we can't leave it that after the music fades, after the final stanza is sung, I mean, does she go out to the sunset and just like this, up to heaven? No, what is it saying? Verse 56. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then return to her home. What happens is after the, the song is sung, you got to live it out. The glory of the grace that, that you say, my soul exalts the Lord. She stays with, with Elizabeth so that until John is born and seeing the, the miraculous birth of, of her, her relative and the faithfulness of God, the impossibility now made possible, what does she do? She returns to life. She must now live out 
what she has declared about the grace of God, about the exaltation of God, about the plan of God. Now she has to deal with it on a minute-to-minute basis on the, where the dirt hits the ground, where, where the rubber meets the road. That, that's, she has to live that out. And she goes from just praising to practice. That it's more than a song. And like, like, like the songs we sing, that keep me just from singing, but move me into action. This is what happens. And so she says, she says it not just with her words, but she says it with her life, that I bring you more than this song. I bring you the living sacrifice of praise. She goes into daily life. And this will be the song of her life. The soundtrack of her life, so to speak. I don't know, she may have sung, I just imagine she may have sung this in her heart as she trekked home, the, alone on that dirt road to Nazareth, reminding her of what God's faithfulness, of God's grace, of God's grandeur. She might, may have hummed it as she had to face Joseph, face her family, face the community, face shame and face uncertainty. She may have sung it with Joseph on the journey to Bethlehem and the hardships and the challenges of that. She may have sung it as she saw the stars in the sky and the shepherds gathering and the magi coming to worship. That the stanzas and the melody of this song may have come to her mind. She may have sung the song as she saw Jesus growing in, in stature in the sight of man and of God. She may have sung this song when Jesus was almost stoned and thrown off a cliff in Nazareth. And she may, may have sung this song through tears as she kneeled at the cross of Christ, seeing, it says, My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She may have sung the song at the resurrection, hearing of the empty tomb and witnessing the victory over death. She must have sung this song as he ascended into the clouds and were awaiting the return. And the same words that she has sung from the moment she, was, she heard the news and likely will sing as she stands face to face with him saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. All that is within me. My spirit rejoiced in God, my Savior. And this is a song that Mary sung with her life, for all her life. And then the question we have to ask is, what song are we singing? What song is the soundtrack of this season for us? Is it all I want for Christmas is you? Is it just very mundane, banal songs that becomes the earworm and soundtrack for this season, and not just this season in our life? Or is it a song that says, my soul magnifies the Lord? What is your remix? What is your mashup? What is the song of your life? What is the song that you are singing to the Christ of Christmas? Let us stand and respond to him. Let's pray. This in your moment. Come with your song. It could just be a simple song like, I need you. It could be a song that says, change my heart, O God. Or I just, I love you, Lord. What is the song that you will bring to the Savior? Just bring it right now. Say it to him in a few stanzas in your heart.
Lord, you come, you reveal yourself. You radiate yourself, Lord, as we heard in Hebrews. You are not a silent God. But Lord, we give you silent praise. When we sing silent night, sometimes it is just a silent night. There's no song that comes out of our heart. It's just karaoke. And our hearts are cold. <clears throat> Lord, we pray that you would touch our hearts. Show us the grandeur of God. Show us the grandeur of Christ. Of grace that has touched us. That who am I? How can it be that a God would come for me and take my place so that I may know you, Lord? Help us to be captured again by that and sing a song with our lives in honor of you until you come. We need you, Lord. Help us. Pray all these things in your name.